And now on your screen is Professor James Hansen of Columbia University and NASA. And he's here to join us to talk about his book, Storms of My Grandchildren. Professor Hansen, what were you doing on your 60th birthday? 60th birthday, that was when I met with Vice President Cheney and six cabinet members and the EPA administrator and the National Security Advisor to talk about global climate change. And this was the Energy and Climate Task Force, uh, which is illogical to combine those because the climate change is due to energy use. Um, and uh, tried to convince them of not only the reality of climate change, but the urgency of doing something about fossil fuel emissions. Because if we would phase those down over the next few decades, we could preserve a climate that is not too different than the Holocene. That's the climate of the last 10,000 years. That's what civilization is adapted to, the shorelines and all the climate zones. But uh, what we're doing, continuing to burn more and more fossil fuels and go after everything we can find, tar sands, tar shale, fracking, deep ocean drilling, this guarantees that we are going to pass to our children and our grandchildren a planet with a climate that is out of their control, which is going to have enormous consequences. And that's not to say the consequences are not going to be felt sooner than that. We're already beginning to see significant uh, climate effects. The fact that we have these strong anomalies, like in 2011 in Texas and Oklahoma, there was an extreme heat wave and drought summer long. The year before in Moscow, in 2003 in France, those are what we call three sigma events, three standard deviations out of the normal. Those kind of events in the summer are now occurring over about 10% of the land area. While with the normal climate of the 20th century, they would have occurred over only two or three tenths of a percent of the land area. So we're seeing things begin to happen already but in the lives of our children and grandchildren, the effects will be much larger. Scientifically, can you draw, can you chart at about 1900 when the uh, oil was used heavily for cars, et cetera, can you chart an increase in how our atmosphere changed? Well, yes. We, we began to measure CO2 very precisely only in the 1950s when David Keeling began to make measurements on Mauna Loa and at the South Pole. However, from ice cores where we have these bubbles of air that are trapped as the snow piles up, it traps the air. And we can sample uh, the air from prior to the 1950s. And CO2, which was about 280 parts per million in the 1800s, uh, began to increase as we began to burn more and more coal and oil and gas. And by the 1950s, it was 315 parts per million. But since then, it's been increasing more and more rapidly. It's now about 390 parts per million. How does that affect us as human beings? Well, it's going to affect us in many ways because from the planet's perspective, what it does is add gases that trap the heat radiation from the Earth. Normally, when the atmospheric composition is constant, the planet will radiate to space just as much energy as it receives from the sun. But if you add these gases, that traps some of the heat radiation. It's like putting a blanket on the planet. So the temp planet is temporarily out of energy balance. That means there's more energy coming in than going out, so the planet gets warmer. And that's what's happening. Uh, it's warmed up by 8 tenths of a degree Celsius in the last century, which is 1 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Over land areas, it's about 2 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. But in addition, we can now measure that the planet is out of energy balance. For because of these gases, there's more energy coming in and going out. It's out of balance by about six tenths of a watt, which doesn't sound like much, but it means that we've got almost as much warming in the pipeline 
which is going to occur over coming decades, even if we stopped increasing CO2. So what we're doing is putting the planet on a course that it will be warmer than it was in the past interglacial period 130,000 years ago when it was about one degree warmer than the Holocene. And even as warm as it was in the Pliocene three or four million years ago. At that time, sea level was 25 meters higher. It's about 80 feet higher. And it was a very different planet. It takes time for the ocean to warm up and for the ice sheets to disintegrate. But we will be starting a process that will be out of the control of young people and future generations. Professor Hansen, you became quite well known in the uh, 2000s for your talks on global warming and quite a political figure at the same time. But you'd been talking about this issue for a couple decades prior, correct? Yeah, the first major paper that I wrote was in 1981, which was published in the Science magazine, and that was reported on the front page of the New York Times by Walter Sullivan, the science writer for the Times. So it got quite a bit of attention, and then I was asked to testify to Congress uh, in the 1980s, and did so, um, and it got quite a bit of attention then, and I decided that that was not what I wanted to do. I prefer to do science. So I decided, after my testimonies in 1988 and 89, that I was going to get out of the public aspect of this and not uh, communicate with the media and things. Because there are other scientists who are actually very good at communicating. Steve Schneider was a friend of mine, and he, he suggested I refer the, <laughs> the media to him, and he was happy to do that, and Michael Oppenheimer also. But So for 15 years, I did not uh, do any interviews on television or testify, but um, after, after these experiences with the Climate Task Force and the Bush administration, I decided, and there are inability to get them to change the policies, I decided I didn't want my grandchildren to say, Opa understood what was happening, but he didn't make it clear. I thought that I could make one very carefully prepared talk and write a scientific paper to go with it, and I tried that, and of course, that's limited success, and that's why I then decided to write the book. Was that 60th birthday meeting a life changer for you? Uh, no, not, not that incident. It wasn't until uh, when I, after I decided to give public talks, I gave one which was supposed to be given in Washington, but the organization that was going to sponsor it, it was in 2004, a few months before the election, they decided that they didn't, they, that Bush might win the election and they didn't want to have repercussions from that. So I had to give, I had to ask my old professor, James Van Allen, at the University of Iowa to arrange a public talk in Iowa City. So I gave the talk there, and of course, limited audience. Um, but the next year, uh, David Keeling's son, Dave Keeling died the next year, and his son asked me to give a talk in his father's honor at the AGU meeting. There, AGU? American Geophysical Union in San Francisco, the annual meeting. So I gave a talk there, and that talk did get attention because there was a lot of a media there, and that led to the White House contacting NASA headquarters and uh, telling them they didn't appreciate um, what I was saying. So then NASA uh, assigned a person to keep track of my talks and prevent me from speaking to the media. And after they had uh, imposed some new rules and those had operated for a few weeks, I then informed the New York Times what was happening and that forced NASA to remove these restrictions on speaking to the media. But uh, it was more that attempt to silence me, which really was the changer. And that was 
what eventually read, led to writing the book because I found that it's so difficult to communicate. It may be easier for some people than for me, but I.